Uh, Nick Nato, Nato uh, you are the deputy spokesperson for Earth Day. Can you just start by telling us what is Earth Day? Yeah, it was an amazing mobilization of citizens, uh, predominantly in the United States in the 1970, well, in 1970, when the world was first starting to glimpse that some environmental issues were actually going global. You know, chemicals, pesticides, uh, the issue of climate change was starting to bumper on the radar. And in the United States, about 12, uh, 20 million people came out and, and said, enough is enough. And they actually changed the political uh, dynamics of the United States. The then President Nixon wasn't so interested in environmental issues, but saw this sheer number of people out on the streets, in the colleges. And actually then, swiftly, you saw the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, clean water, clean air, uh, legislation, many things. And then in 1972, because of this impulse coming from the states and starting to happen all around the world, the United Nations met here in Stockholm in 1972. It was the first conference on the human environment, and it gave birth to the United Nations Environment uh, Program. So then the UN had an agency on the environment. So those were the beginnings. Now it's about a billion people around the world every year come out and, and do stuff for the environment uh, in uh, over 190 countries. So it's really morphed and, uh, and is growing for sure. And what kind of stuff do you do? Well, you know, we are the catalyst, so we announce a theme every year. I'm delighted to say that the theme for 2020 is going to be climate change. Uh, this is what we've announced literally today uh, here in Stockholm. Uh, and uh, we create the theme, we create the, the information that supports people's activities, and people just get out. Sometimes it's entry point stuff, like maybe a cleanup of their local community. They're just kind of learning, or in a sense, about the environment. But for others, uh, it can inspire them to, to much higher things. It inspires artists and musicians as well. Uh, so it creates a, a kind of global groundswell in many parts of the world across a range of issues, normally connected with the annual theme. So the annual theme for 2019 is protect our species. So it's about what you call biodiversity, you know, plants and animals. Uh, they're in serious trouble right now. And next year will be the big existential issue uh, of climate change. So tell us about that launch you did today. Yeah, the launch day has been basically a social media launch. Uh, you know, I'm uh, very pleased to announce that one of our major campaigns that's going to be for 2020, but will start right now uh, through 2019, is uh, a campaign called Vote Earth. And basically, we want people to get out, really research the, the candidates in national elections all around the world, and basically find the ones that have the strongest climate change policies and vote for them and also to hold account those candidates that don't have climate change policies. Why? Why not? Particularly young people, because if you look at the statistics of young people voting, it's often a bit too low, quite frankly. And we want to reflect the, the urgency of the school strikes that are going on right now, the new mobilization of youth and children, uh, and of a younger generation, because the future for them will be very grim if we don't deal with climate change, and they need to basically decide what kind of future leaders they want. They should vote Earth. We also have uh, this big election coming up in May in Europe, the European Parliament. Exactly. So our first target is the European elections, which take place between the 23rd and the 26th of May. And so that is our main first uh, engagement on this campaign, Vote Earth. And we will then pivot into the many, many other national elections that are happening this year in Europe, but around the world. And next year in 2020, there's more than 60 uh, national elections, including in the United States. So these are very important. I mean, who, who you actually vote into power will have a pivotal role on whether they actually make the right policies for the right reasons, for the right kind of future that every human being requires, or whether they're going to continue to drag their feet and whether they're going to continue to fiddle around the edges and not really seize the opportunity of what a climate change transition actually means. Uh, and 2020 is coming up next year, and I know this is an important year for climate. Can you tell us about that? It's an absolutely critical year for so many environmental issues. In terms of climate change, this is the year when greenhouse gas emissions are supposed to peak in line with the, the goals, the aims, and the aspirations of the landmark uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement of 2015. And 2020 is supposed to set the stage for a decarbonisation of the global economy up to 2050. 
So, you know, we have to seize the opportunity and put the pressure on governments to do that. Last year, there was something called the Global Climate Action Summit, where businesses, cities, investors from around the world, investors with $32.5 trillion, one third bigger than the global economy, actually saying that they will invest this in a green economy, in an eco-friendly economy. So that was the stage at which you might say the non-government type organizations came together to say, we want more action, we need to step up right now. In September this year, the UN Secretary General will actually convene heads of state in uh, New York and ask them, are you ready to actually up your ambition? So we need to keep that mobilization, that pressure going. And hopefully by 2020, when the UN convenes its, its climate conference, we don't know the country yet, the governments will be ready to basically say, yes, we're stepping up our ambition, upping our national climate action plans in line with the urgency of the Paris Agreement. What do you think uh, the chances are we can reach the Paris Agreement? Well, you know, already there are dozens upon dozens of countries that have actually shown you can decouple economic growth from pollution. And they're mainly in the developed countries because maybe they started off earlier. Uh, they're still behind the curve, but we're seeing this decoupling. Can we do it? Yes, of course we can. I mean, it's about, you know, we have all the technology to actually make a change. We have more money in the world right now flowing around the system than we've ever had. The problem with it is that basically it, not enough of it is actually going into the financing the transition to a green economy, to a low carbon economy, which is a crazy thing because right now interest rates are so low in most countries that people in some countries are actually paying banks to look after their money. Why don't we take that money and actually invest it in, in, in the kind of transitions we need so we can guarantee a healthy functioning planet uh, for this generation, but more particularly for the next generation and the next generation after that. What is the best way, you think, to fight climate crisis? It has to happen in multiple directions, but I think one thing is that we have to make sure that governments have in place the kinds of policies that basically say to the financial markets, you know, enough is enough. We don't want you to finance environmental degradation. We don't want you to finance the destruction of this planet. We don't want short-termism over a long-term transitional investment. So that's absolutely critical. Central bank setting policies, government setting policies, and stock exchanges and other types uh, uh, of institutions in the financial area. The other thing is we need to mobilize citizens because right now, 100 cities, mega cities are moving on climate change. Thousands and thousands of more small cities, over 500 large corporations are aligning their emission reduction pathways with the Paris Agreement, and many governments are moving too. But the fact is it's a fragile transition because right now the citizens, many citizens, are sitting and watching and waiting, and they need to come out and basically demand what they want because citizens give governments and corporations the license to operate and right now they're not quite sure what license they're giving them they need to give them a transformational license that will actually change the dynamics of the global economy uh, how do we need to co communicate to make people care Interesting question, right? I've been in uh, communications director for many UN agencies and I was a journalist on the Times newspaper in the 1990s covering environment and stuff. And sometimes you think you have to shock people, sometimes you have to give them optimism. I think you need a bit of both. I think you need good cop and bad cop. People need to really wake up right now. People cannot taste or see or feel the tragedy that's unfolding by not acting on climate change. And I think people need a really strong wake-up call right now because the Paris Agreement was fantastic in 2015, but it came late. It should have happened in Copenhagen in 2009. So we are, as a world, moving in, in ways we've never dreamt of. Renewable energy is doubling now every 5.5 years, perhaps even faster. We're now seeing the electrification of transportation systems, which once were a bit of a joke, right? And so all kinds of things are happening which people don't even notice, and yet, there are loads of areas where we're not moving. Our agricultural systems, the way we're treating forests and soils, what's happening to our oceans, all the natural infrastructure that we need, just as much as the technological and technical infrastructure to make this transition. Uh, we Don't Have Time just released a new social network. Uh, yep. What are your thoughts on uh, trying to make a change in this way? I think it's absolutely vital that we get more information out there. I think that we live in a very curious world right now where we, we, we love social media and things like that. We all find it very exciting and it's a good way of getting your information. But the algorithms that actually go on behind the scenes mean that some people are actually being deprived of the real information. 
there are many people around the world who perhaps once they just Googled mm, climate skeptic or climate is, is rubbish or something like that, and now Google and all the other institutions that do the algorithms, right, think, oh, these people don't care about climate change. So they never see the evidence. So if a platform like this can break through this kind of complexity of the algorithms and really present the evidence to people, really wake them up in terms of what's happening and see the opportunities that will flow in terms of decent jobs and more livable cities and cleaner air if we do act on climate change then it can make a real difference and I think some of the positive news that this platform is pumping out is quite useful uh, and also I think if it leads to an engagement with a different kind of, of, of uh, citizen because right now citizens are sort of in different camps you know you've got the green groups and then you've got some other groups and whatever but there really isn't a kind of strong mobilization of citizens generally with the right information and the right excitement to actually take action. Do you think the leaders will listen to people's uh, climate campaigns? Yes. 1970 showed that President Nixon, who was very skeptical about the environment, suddenly saw the sheer numbers of people out in the United States and the laws changed. It can happen. And if a little girl you know, uh, a 16-year-old girl called Greta, who nobody imagined, nobody had any idea that this individual would emerge onto the global scene, can suddenly arrive like a magical, you know, manner from heaven. You know, all kinds of stuff is possible. Finally, to everyone out there wanting to do something, what do you want to tell them? I think they should vote Earth. So if they're Europeans, they should really, really knuckle down and do some serious research on the candidates before them in their particular countries and regions and find out if these people are serious. And they should also hold the ones that aren't serious to account. They should vote her. And they should, if they have a bit of money, if they have a pension fund, they should find out where they're investing it. If they're a consumer, find out what the companies are doing with the products that you buy every day and start holding companies, governments, cities, as well as national governments, accountable for the actions that they are taking, or we might say, not taking enough at the moment.